And thank you. <clears throat> our study on Sunday evenings is the book of Romans. Last week we had our first lecture, an introductory lecture, in which we talked about the importance of this book, tremendously important book. In fact, many scholars believe it's probably the most important book in the Bible because in this book, the Apostle Paul, under, this, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, lays out the great plan of salvation. He just sort of lays out what biblical Christianity is all about. We also talked about its impact on uh, great individuals in the history of the church, and it has had a tremendous impact. We also talked about Paul's occasion for writing it. He was wrapping up his third missionary journey. He was in Corinth. He wanted to take an offering to Jerusalem and then go to Spain, and on the way he wanted to stop in Rome and see the brothers and sisters in Rome. And this book of Romans is that letter he wrote to the church at Rome telling them about his forthcoming visit. He did make it to Rome, but not quite the way he thought. He didn't make it to Rome on his way to Spain. He woke, made it to Rome in chains. And he ended up having more of a ministry there than he had planned. Uh, it was while he was there that he encouraged the brothers and sisters and wrote the prison epistles, which have benefited all of us, particularly for me, the book of Philippians, which I think is one of the great all-time books in the, in the Bible. Uh, this evening... What I want to do is give you an overview of the entire book, which is really sort of an explanation for the outline you have on page one. Uh, my feeling on learning, as well as teaching, is to try to get a sense of the whole and then start working your way through the particulars. Uh, books of Bibles are like great tapestries. They're great works of art. And you need a sense of what the whole is, and then you can better appreciate the individual parts. So what I want to try to do now for a little while this evening is just walk through the entire book and lay out Paul's argument. We'll actually be doing this repeatedly throughout the coming months. What you need to do is learn about everything in context. I know we've heard that before, but so often we don't practice it. There are lots of Christian, I put that in quotes, cults out there. And often they are established by people who grab one idea here, one idea over there, one over yonder, out of context, and they distort. And a lot of folks just don't know enough about the Bible to know that uh, what they're being taught is the distortion of the truth. One of the ways to avoid that is always see what you're studying in context of the whole. You need to see all of Romans, every aspect of Romans in context of the whole book of Romans. So what we're going to do is start that process this evening by going through an overview of the book. It's divided really into six sections. The first section is Paul's introduction. It's made up of the salutation, a brief message from Paul about his desire to visit Rome. We've talked about that. He'll talk about that again in the 15th chapter. Uh, this letter is the church at Rome telling him about a forthcoming visit. He's going to mention that a little bit in the introduction. And then in verses 16 and 17, he's going to lay out the theme of the book. And the reason he's uh, going to have this theme and develop it is because, as we pointed out last week, he didn't found the church at Rome. Uh, he probably hadn't even met the brothers and sisters there. He didn't know what they knew. All of his other letters were letters to churches that he had founded or individuals that he had discipled. So he knew what they knew. He knew that they already had essentially what he laid out here in Romans. So all he had to do was to deal with a particular problem. When he comes to the church at Rome, he didn't know what they knew. So it's almost like he said, let me take this opportunity to make sure they understand the big picture. What's going on in this new thing called the church and justification by faith. Which it makes it very beneficial to us. Okay, the introduction begins with a salutation in verses 1 through 7. The salutation is the greeting. And in the greeting that Paul wrote in this letter, he wrote his greeting or salutation in the same way everyone in the first century wrote their greetings or salutations. Uh, a writer of a letter would begin with his own name, then maybe a little short message, and then he would write down the name of the person to whom he was sending the letter. I remember when I first started studying the Bible, I thought the salutations were unique to the Scriptures. It begins with Paul. We'll, we'll read it right here. Verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thought this was a form of salutation that was unique to the Bible. It is not. That's the way everyone wrote letters. Uh, and actually, it makes more sense. When we write letters in our era, 
we put the name of the individual to whom we're going to write, Dear Joe, and then not, we don't put our name until the end. So when I get letters, I have to go to the end of the letter to find out who really had a much better idea. <laughs> so Paul was doing what men just normally did. It's not unique to scriptures. Paul then wrote about, in verses 8 through 15, about his desire to visit Rome, which is sort of the primary reason for the letter. Let me tell you why I'm writing this letter. I'm writing this letter to tell you on my way to Spain, I'm going to stop by for a visit. Paul then lays out the theme of the book in verses 16 and 17. He's letting him know what the rest of the letter is going to be about. In verses 16 and 17, Paul wrote this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by, it is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now, as pointed out last week, man's problem of being separated from God because of sin uh, can be expressed two ways, a negative way and a positive way. The negative way is this. You are a sinner destined for hell. Is that not true? But it can also be expressed in a positive way. And that is this. We all need to be righteous to go to heaven. So Paul does it both ways. In this letter, he talks about salvation. That is, you need to be, you're a sinner, you need to be saved from your destiny in hell. He also lays out the positive solution to our problem. That is, you need to be righteous to stand before God in heaven. Uh, one of the reasons I bring this up is because you sort of need to understand this as we work our way through this book, and actually you need to understand this as you work your way through the Bible. One of the reasons is this. We, as 21st century Christians, invariably present the gospel in a negative way. There's nothing wrong with that, the negative aspect of it. You're a sinner. You're on your way to hell. You need to embrace Christ as your Savior because on the cross, he took the penalty you deserve for your sins so that you can escape hell. That's the way we normally present the gospel, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that is one of the proper ways to present it. They almost never presented it that way in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they, they didn't have a, partly because they didn't have a great concept of hell. And they didn't really have a great concept of heaven. They just knew they were separated from God. And the only way they could stand before God was to be righteous. So, in, and the reason if you understand that so is because as you work your way through the Old Testament, they're constantly talking about the necessity to be righteous, the necessity to be righteous, the necessity to be righteous. What they're really talking about is another positive way of salvation. See? And you see it right here in, in Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. In other words, who may stand in the presence of God? He who is righteous. And you'll find that throughout the Old Testament, uh, right, uh, uh, our problem is, is expressed that way. How can I stand before God? And you're going to find that this is true in the book of Romans as well. In the New Testament, the emphasis is on the negative. We need to escape hell. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He said, whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So you got this down? I want you to be able to read through the Bible with a whole lot more understanding. I think sometimes when people read through the Old Testament, they don't know that they're talking about salvation. When they talk about the the necessity for righteousness. They're just talking about the positive aspect of salvation. Okay, And Paul does both in stating the theme. Jesus Christ solves our problems both negatively and positively. positively. In the negative aspect, Jesus paid our penalty in hell. When he was on the cross, all of our sins were laid on him. And the penalty due to each individual in the lake of fire was placed on him, and he took that penalty. He took my sin, he took my penalty. He also, when I embrace him as my Savior, he gives me his righteousness. So, my sins were placed on Christ. He took my eternity in hell upon himself. Negative aspect taken care of. I can be saved from eternity in hell. But he does more. He says, David, once you embrace me as your Savior, I'm going to give you my It's the universe. He takes my sin and gives me his righteousness. 
You get to both the positive and the negative. You, you, you understand this? This is really important stuff. Don't see this whole process of coming to God just in terms of the negative. See it in terms of both because they're both rich. He takes my sin. He gives me his righteousness. How can anybody be unhappy with this deal? It's the best deal. Eat your heart out, Donald Trump. <laughs> now, how do we get this? By faith, faith, faith. He points it out again. Let's read. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who what? Believes first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God. That's the positive aspect is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. This is a great deal. God, the Son, takes my sin, gives me his righteousness. How do I make, how, how, how can I participate in this, 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 this situation? Faith. That's it. And, of course, that's a big part of what he's going to be talking about in uh, a few chapters in this book. Now, that's the theme. Justification by faith. And the word justification, you can think salvation if you wish. The word justification is a word we'll be using a lot as we work our way through Romans. Justification simply means to be declared righteous. It has a little bit more to it than just salvation. It is a term that is used to describe the sovereign ruler of the universe declaring you to be righteous. He talks about his righteousness being declaring you righteous. He's talking about righteousness by his standard of righteousness, which is perfect righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus Christ is the righteousness of God himself. God, when you accepted Christ as your Savior, the God of the universe declared you as righteous as he. That's extraordinary. And we use a word called justification for that. So when we talk about justification, we're talking about God declaring you to be righteous. And how do we become righteous? How do we get Because of the Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. He took our sins. He gives us his righteousness by faith. All right. Now, the theme is justification by faith. That is being declared righteous by faith in the atoning death of Jesus Christ. Paul wants to develop that theme. But before he develops the theme, he's got to convince his readers that they need it. Now, most people agree that bad people are going to need help if they get to heaven. But the truth is, most people don't believe that everybody needs Jesus Christ to get to heaven. Lots of people think, well, I'm a pretty good guy, and uh, so I don't need Jesus Christ to get to heaven. And not only that, there's that guy in India who never heard the gospel. He probably won't need to accept Christ as his Savior. And then there's this uh, moral lady. She doesn't need it because she's pretty moral. And these very religious people, they won't need it either. So really what Paul does is this. He recognizes that his readers, in fact, readers for the next 2,000 years, will not believe that everyone needs to be saved. Even many Christians today don't believe that everyone needs to be saved. Uh, there was a fellow, uh, Rob Bell, who wrote a book, Love Wins. He was an evangelical pastor in Grand Rapids. And he wrote a book called Love Wins, saying basically everybody gets to heaven because God loves everybody. So this is a problem that's ongoing. Paul has a wonderful theme, justification by faith. But before he can develop it, he's got to make certain that his re readers recognize that everybody needs to be justified by faith. Uh, now, most people, the natural man, and even many Christians believe that some folks should get a pass. First, the person who should get a pass is the pagan who's never heard the gospel. This is the aborigine in Australia. It's the man in India. It's the American Indians before the colonists came in, the Aztec, the Indians. You know what it's like. You've been out there. You've presented the gospel to people. And you'll say that you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior if you want to go to heaven and escape hell. Right. That's basically, you probably are a little slower than I was when you presented it. But that's what you do. You explain that to them. And they say, well, what about that Indian in the 12th century who never heard the gospel? And your answer is, well, I hope your answer is he still needs the Savior. Well, he does need the Savior. Uh, but people say, well, that doesn't seem fair. So they don't want to believe that he needs Christ as a Savior. And then the, that, that gentleman down the block, he's just a wonderful guy. He's a moral man. So the first guy Paul's going to be talking about is the pagan. 
who never heard the gospel and why he still needs Jesus Christ. And then folks bring up the moral man down the block. And the, and the Bible does not deny that some people are more moral than others. The Bible will put forth a position of the total depravity of man, but it never suggests that all people are totally depraved. The Bible does recognize that some people are more moral than others, and there's a whole section on it that we're working our way through here shortly in Romans. So you present the gospel, and the guy says, well, you know, I know this guy down the block. He doesn't lie. He doesn't cheat. He doesn't steal. He's been faithful to his wife for 50 years. Anytime anybody's sick in the neighborhood, he and his wife are there with food to help. If someone needs help on the house, there's a widow down the block. He's over there helping her with the house. He's a very moral man. You mean if he doesn't know Jesus Christ is his Savior, he's going to go to hell? Yes. That's right. The, but, but, but what he's trying to do, deal with, Paul is dealing with here, is dealing with those who would be opposed to the idea of moral people going to hell because they don't know Christ. He, the whole world feels this way. And then, of course, someone will bring up the religious man. You mean that guy in India, that, that, that uh, Buddhist monk who's living a life of self-sacrifice and devotion, you mean he needs Christ as his Savior? Well, yes, he does. But the question that still rises and has risen for 2,000 years. You present the gospel to folks and they say, well, what about all those other religions? You mean they, those, all those people, all those other religions other than Christianity are going to go to hell if they don't know Christ? And the answer is yes. But Paul has to deal with that question. And really what he's going to do is say that the pagan who's never heard the gospel and the moral man who lives a good life, and the religious man. And what he does is, what's very interesting here, is God could have picked any religion in the, in the world to show how the religion isn't enough to save you. Only Jesus Christ can save you. And rather than picking any one of the thousands of religions, he picks the very best one, the one God invented, which is Judaism. And he says, basically, Judaism won't save you. So if Judaism won't save you, none of the lesser religions will save you. And so that's what Paul has to do before he can develop the doctrine of justification by faith. He has to show that absolutely everybody, including the pagan man and the moral man and the religious man, need to embrace Christ as their Savior. Now, what God is going to say is that each of these individuals has been given some light. Each has failed to respond to that light. Each is guilty. Each is without excuse. Each will bear his punishment. The pagan man, you say, well, uh, God is going to hold him responsible. Uh, uh, if he doesn't know Christ is his Savior, he's going to go to hell? Yes, because basically Paul's going to present an argument in the first chapter of Romans. The argument is this. He received a measure of light. General revelation. You understand general revelation? We'll talk about it more later. That's God's revelation in creation, God's innate giving. Not only does he give us a sense of his existence in creation, he gives us an innate sense that God exists. So all men can look at creation, get a sense that there's a real God, and yet men, all those pagans, deliberately suppress the truth of God that they saw in creation and turn to idols. So each of them had a revelation. They didn't have the revelation, special revelation of the Word of God, but they had a revelation. Each suppressed it, so each is without excuse. He's going to say to the moral man, the moral man is without excuse because God blessed the moral man. He gave him more revelation than the general revelation he gave the pagan man. He gave him a heightened sense of right and wrong. The heightened sense of right and wrong should have led the moral man, that guy down the block who's so good to everybody, should have given him a sense of his own failure, because nobody the Lord is going, that Paul is going to write about shortly, no man has lived up to the light he has. So if you have a heightened sense of morality, you have a greater sense of your own failure, a failure that should have led you to, to cry out to God for forgiveness. And then there's the religious person. Even Judaism won't save. What about the little old lady who gets up every morning and goes to Mass? I don't know if she's saved or not, but I'm sure there are many who are not. I could say, what about the evangelical who comes to church every day, every Sunday? You know, what people think of when they think of religion as a, as, as, as a way to heaven, they think they can sign up for Christianity the way they sign up for the JCs or the Moose Club. You, know, you can sign up for the Moose Club and you are a what? Moose. 
You can sign up for the JCs, and you're a JC. You can sign up for the Marine Corps if you pass the physical in the middle. Uh, you're a Marine. You don't sign up for Christianity. You didn't sign up for Judaism. That's the point he's trying to make. You can't simply sign up for it and be sign up for Christianity at the door. Now you're a Christian, you go to heaven. That's his point. Religions don't get you there. The only way you can get there is by personally embracing Christ as your Savior. That's his theme. So, before Paul can develop the theme of justification by faith, he has to help his readers come to understand that absolutely everybody's a candidate for this doctrine. The pagan man is a candidate. Uh, even though he never heard the gospel, he did get a measure of light. He deliberately suppressed that light and is guilty. The moral man or woman who accept Christ as his or her Savior will be found guilty of suppressing the light he or she had and will go to hell if he or she doesn't know Christ. The religious person, I don't care how religious you are, your religions don't save you. Only Christ saves you for it. So, basically what Paul does is he's trying to convince the whole world, the universal need for the gospel, that they need this message. And then he wraps all of this up with this devastating denunciation of, of all of mankind in the third chapter of Romans. And in this third chapter of Romans, he lays out the greatest single statement of the total depravity of man you'll read anywhere in Scripture. I'm just going to read a portion of it for you. Page 19. What shall we conclude then? He's gone through the pagan man and the moral man and the religious man, showing how each has received a, me received a measure of light, each suppressed that measure of light, each is guilty and will bear his punishment. Then he says, he talks about the whole world. He says, what shall we, what shall we conclude then? Are any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles are alike, alike are all under sin. As it is written, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands, no one seeks God. All have turned away and have together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. And this is God's indictment of the entire human race. And incidentally, all of this is drawn from the Old Testament, which should also raise a red flag. It's God's way of, when God repeats something, pay close attention. Their throats are open graves. Whose throats are open graves? Ours. Let's just, just make it personal. Our throats are open graves. Our throat, tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on our lips. Our mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Our feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their, our ways. The way of peace we do not know. And in verse 18 is the reason. No fear of God before our eyes. So Paul states the theme, justification by faith, and he says, but first I've got to convince you folks, my readers, that everybody is a candidate for this doctrine. Nobody gets a pass. The, pa the pagan who didn't hear the gospel doesn't get a pass. The moral man who's alive, moral life, doesn't get a pass. The religious ze zealot doesn't get a pass. And why? Because we're all totally depraved. Now, we're not all equally depraved. We're all totally depraved. God, sin has touched the heart of everyone. And some will say, yeah, but if you keep the law, and Paul sort of wraps it up by saying, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. And what he's going to do is develop this to say, no one can keep the law perfectly. The only way you can get to heaven, if you can keep the law perfectly, but nobody can. What the law does is God's standard of righteousness to let us know how far short we are of the mark. All right, now that Paul has stated his theme, and told us that, in section 2, that absolutely everybody is a candidate for this gospel of justification by faith. He then talks about the doctrine of justification by faith. When we closed up section 2, things looked hopeless. A problem, and it's very clear there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. We're hopelessly lost. But there's good God loves us and wants to us. But God had a problem. How can God be both just and justifier? And we'll be talking about this a lot. How can God be both just and justifier? Think of it this way, Fred. I'm going to pick on you. This is what happens you up on the front row. God says, I love you, Fred. And God, we know that God does love Fred. I love you. I want you to be with me in the eternity future. One day I'm going to create a new heaven and a new earth. I want you to be there with me. We're going to travel the universe together. You're for it. He likes it. You have to leave your motorcycle in Philadelphia, but that's okay. I love you. Now, but unfortunately, you're loaded with sin, Fred. 
Maybe not as much as the rest of these folks, but you're loaded with sin. Now, I could just overlook your sin and say, I forget it. And sort of like the judges in Vermont do that we were talking about. <laughs> yeah, pedophile. Six months suspended sentence. Yeah. So we could be like that. God could do that. And we could say he's a very forgiving God. Yes. Very merciful God. Yes. Very loving God. Yes. But one thing we couldn't say about him any longer is, is a just God. He would no longer be a just God. You see, God, as the sovereign ruler of the universe, has a very real responsibility for the moral health of the universe. This isn't a minor issue. Stop apologizing for God's wrath against sin. If God didn't reach out to destroy sin, the whole universe would be the stinking mess that we have made to planet Earth. You want that? Is that would that be an exciting eternity future? Can you imagine watching the, the Democrats and Republicans fight it out for eternity future? <laughs> Annihilate me. So God could say, I'm an over I love you, Fred. He does love you. I could just overlook him. But if he did that, he would no longer be a just judge. He would no longer be fulfilling his responsibility as the sovereign ruler of the universe to care for its moral health. As Tozer, and you've heard me quote this many times, Tozer said, God hates, every time God reaches out to destroy sin, it's a holy act of preservation. He's reaching out to destroy that which would destroy his universe. God hates sin the way a mother hates the polio virus that would destroy the life of her child. God has a moral responsibility to destroy sin. That's the reason he will always remain a just judge. But that gives God a problem. God has a problem. God says, you're loaded with sin, Fred. I am the just judge of the universe. As a just judge of the universe, I must punish your sin the same time I love you and want to forgive your sin. How can I solve the problem? How can I be just and justifier? That's it. God said, I came up with a solution. What I'm going to do is take all of your sin upon myself and take the punishment you deserve. Now, my wrath against your sin has been satisfied. I can forgive you and still be a just judge. Isn't that brilliant? God is so smart. I love it. How could God be just, just, just and justifier? God could say, I love you so much, I will overlook your sin. He would be forgiving and perhaps merciful God, but not a just God. He would be failing in his responsibility to maintain the moral health of the universe. In Romans 3, he's going to pick up this, and we're going to discuss it more. I'm just giving you a, sort of an overview now. God presented Jesus as a sacrifice to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just. All our sins were placed on Jesus Christ, and and the one who justifies those who have faith in Christ. He came up with a solution to be just and justifier. Now God isn't compromising his holy righteousness one iota when he forgives your sin. At the same time, now he can forgive your sin because he's taking the penalty himself. Beautiful. Moving on. God's solution, as we just pointed out, he was determined to express his love and forgiveness for man. God was so determined to maintain his God was also determined to maintain his holiness and righteousness, so he bore our punishment himself, which enabled God to be just and justifier. All that is required of men is that they embrace Christ by faith. Again, let me read it. Romans 3, 26. God presented Jesus Christ as a sacrifice to demonstrate his justice so at the present time, at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Isn't that brilliant? I love it. Now, at this point in Paul's discussion, that, was, that took up the second half of Romans chapter 3, we're going to have two million Jews screaming, wait a minute, Paul, this all sounds good, but you know, we have a 2,000-year history with God. And in that 2,000-year history, we haven't heard about this. Justification by faith apart from works. If you want to be saved in, the Jewish, in Judaism, you need to be circumcised, if you're a male, and you had to obey the law. That's how they viewed it. They viewed it as works, 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 works. And so, Paul, this is something brand new. They weren't happy. What are you talking about? Faith in the Messiah, faith in the Messiah, faith in the Messiah. Paul, this is brand new. What about all those Old Testament saints? Paul said, let me tell you, friend, and this is what he's telling them right here. 
this thing about justification by faith is not brand new. It is as old as our father Abraham. And then what he does is he quotes Genesis 15, 6. He's quoting it here in Romans 4. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was what? Credited to him as righteousness. Now what's interesting about this situation was God made this great promise to Abraham called the Abrahamic covenant. We're all familiar with it. I'll make of you a great nation. I'll give you the land of Israel and bless the world through you. Abraham believed God and it was what? Credited to him as righteousness. That was just faith. And when Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, that was before Abraham was circumcised, and it was 400 years before God gave Moses the law. So the doctrine of justification by faith precedes circumcision and law. So what Paul is saying, this isn't brand new, folks. This is old as Father Abraham. That killed that argument. Now, before he leaves this doctrine of justification by faith, He's got to answer one more question, and that is this. How well does it work, this justification by faith? You mean all I've got to do is recognize that I'm a sinner. As a sinner, I'm an object of God's wrath against sin. I can embrace Christ and his atoning death for salvation. How well does it work? Will it, is it, will it make me eternally secure? And that's what the fifth chapter of Romans is about, eternal security. It works. Now, some would say, well, why would they ask that question? Just this. Faith is scary. Faith is scary. Because when you have faith, you're depending totally on someone else, not yourself. If we were given the option, we'd probably choose something else. <laughs> like, if God came down and said, i tell you what. If you want to be saved, make a trip to Israel. Sort of like Muslims making their trip to Mecca, make a trip to Israel, pray once a day, give 10% of your income to the church, and you go to heaven. You know, that would be kind of, that would try to be, very, that would, people would like that. You know why? Because now I don't have to depend on anybody but myself. I did what I was supposed to do. I signed up for the package. I paid my, I paid the price. Now, I have my ticket to heaven. I mean, it's sort of like you, you, want to, you want to fly to Miami, you go to the airline, you buy a ticket, they got to let you on, right? Unless you carry a gun. So, Bill, pay attention. <laughs> He's my local gun guy. See, when you buy the ticket, you pay the price, you can sort of demand. We like that. We do. You see, this one you can't pay for. He paid for it. You've got to depend on him totally and completely, and that's scary. I'd much rather depend on myself taking care of the matter than someone else. That's just the natural inclination we have. And so Paul recognized that some people would say, you know, that's, that's very enlightening, Paul, this justification by faith, but how good is it? Will it keep me eternally secure? And the fifth chapter of Romans he will discuss that subject and say, yes, it does. It works perfectly well. In fact, it's the only way that works, and it's eternally secure. And he'll have a long discussion. We'll have a long discussion of eternal security. Now, moving to section four. Once a person is saved, God expects him or her to live a godly life. This is called sanctification. Justification thinks salvation. You embrace Christ as your Savior he declare, by faith. And he declares you righteous. You've been saved. You've been born again. Now he says, I want you to go out and live a godly life. I don't live a godly life to earn my salvation. Once I am born again to God's kingdom, now he does expect me to live a godly life. Living a godly life is tough. Some of you folks probably maybe don't have so much trouble with it, but some of us have had a hard time living godly lives. I think it's tough overcoming sin. Over, it's tough overcoming old habits. And so God has come to our rescue. In chapter 7, he says the believers are dead to their old nature. I mean, chapter 6. Chapter 7, we're dead to the law. In chapter 8, we're alive to the Holy Spirit. God helps us in our sanctification by enabling us to die to our old natures, 
die to the law and live for the Holy Spirit. Now, when we talk about death in the Bible, it does not mean annihilation. It does not mean that something ceases to exist. In the Bible, the word death means separation. Separation. James says that the body without the soul is dead. They're separated. Now, the body still exists. It goes in the grave, and one day it'll be resurrected. The soul goes to be with the Lord, or it goes to the abyss. They both still exist, but they're separated. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they died spiritually. It doesn't mean their spirit ceased to exist, but they were separated from God. It, the lake of fire is called the second death. It doesn't mean that those who are cast into the lake of fire cease to exist. It means they're eternally sec- separated from God. Death means separation. That's important because there have been a lot of and, and chapter 6 of Romans has led to whole denominational developments because people thought that being dead to the old nature speaks of annihilation of the old nature. The doctrine of eradication of sin, the Nazarene doctrine, sprang from that. Let me help you understand what I'm getting at. When I was an unbeliever, I have a will. This is what I will to do, what I choose to do. And I only have one nature, a sin nature. I was born with it, an Adamic nature, an old nature, a sin nature. A lot of names for it in the Bible. We'll go through those when we get to chapter 6. Now, I'm a slave to my sin nature. A nature isn't so much something that's tangible. It's a propensity to act in a particular way. Let me illustrate that with pigs. If you take a pig and you skin it, take a cat and skin it, anatomically they're very similar. They have similar skeletal systems, similar muscular systems, similar cardiovascular systems, uh, similar uh, digestive systems, nervous systems. They're very, very similar. But they both have different natures, don't they? Pigs love wallowing in mud. Cats hate mud, right? Now, you can take a pig and you can scrub it down. You can perfume it. You put a nice ribbon around its neck, take it for a walk. I think I've got myself... An animal that loves cleanliness. Not nope, many disease, but it's going to die for it. Because it has a nature that loves mud. Cats have a nature that love cleanliness. Now, how can I get a pig to act like a cat? If I had some way of cutting the cord to its mud-loving nature and give it a nature that loves cleanliness, now what would happen? It would love cleanliness. Or if I could get a pig nature in a cat, it would love mud. That's our situation. You and you and I are born, we are born with only one nature. It's an Adamic nature, a sin nature, an old nature. We have natures that love sinning. Why do people sin? They love sin, which is why all of the, the humanistic efforts to change the nature of mankind without giving you a new nature are doomed. You understand that? You're never going to make people and societies righteous as long as they have old sin natures that love sinning. Forget all the psycho babble that explains bad behavior away. People sin because they have sin natures. Now, what happens when we're born again? God says we die to our sin natures. In other words, we've been separated from it. The cord that bound my will to my sin nature is cut. So I, I'm dead to my sin nature, or, or I'm separated from my sin nature. You see what's happening? Not only that, he gives me a new nature, his nature that cannot sin. Now I've got a choice. I can plug my will into my old nature. Now how am I going to act? Like a pig. I can plug my, my will into my new nature, and I'm going to act like a cat. No, 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 follow me along on our metaphor. In addition to that, God gives us the Holy Spirit. So in chapter 6, what Paul says, once you get saved, once you're justified by faith, God wants you to go out and live a godly life. Now we know that before you were saved, you were locked in. You were enslaved. Paul's going to talk about we were enslaved to our sin natures. And actually, all unbelievers are enslaved. They have one cord and it's tied to their sin nature. They are bound to it. They're enslaved to it, which is why they sin. But once I get saved, that cord has been severed. And not only has it been severed so that I'm no longer enslaved to my sin nature, God has given me His nature. I can plug into that, and it can't sin. Oh, that's good. And He gives me the Holy Spirit to encourage me. So I get a little help. Chapter 6 of Romans is going to talk about 
the fact that Christians are dead to their old nature. They've been separated from them. I'm no longer enslaved to it. I have an option now. That's chapter 6. I don't want to spend too much time on it. We don't have a lot of time. But Now, chapter 7, he talks about Christians are dead to the law. That's the big chapter on being dead to the law. You say, well, how does that help? Separated from it. Think of it this way. You're walking through the park. Now, your ladies are probably not as depraved as some of us guys, but you're walking through the park. You may not identify with this. And you come along a park bench that says, the sign says, wet paint, do not touch. I, got, I always have to test that out. Rich does, too. It's the reason he's laughing at me. Your son comes home from school. There's a box on the dining room table with a sign from mom. Do not look inside the box. (laughs) You understand what's going on here. There's something about law that arouses us to sin. And that's his point in chapter 7. And this is the reason Paul says in Romans 7, there will be a whole lot of passages to it about it as well. For when we were controlled by our sin natures, remember like the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, dying, being separated from being bound to our sin natures, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. And this is my favorite. 1 Corinthians 15, 6, the sting of death is sin. The power of sin is what? The law. Paul wrote, and he's actually going to begin Romans 7 with this. I didn't know what coveting was until I read, don't covet. I can imagine he was a young boy studying the law. He had never even found out. He had never even thought about what coveting was. But then he says, don't covet, don't covet. He says, oh, I started coveting. So actually, the law, and you're saying, well, the law must be bad. No, it isn't. The law is good. The law tells me what God's standard of righteousness is. That's good. It also tells me what I, how I should live. But it also can arouse the sinful passions in us, is what the passage said, so that we end up sinning more. So what God does is when you get saved is he severs the cord that bound you like a slave to your sin nature, and you're no longer under the law. You're no longer under the law. So the law should no longer be so effective on your own sin nature that's arousing those sinful passions. The third way God helps us live sanctified lives is that He gives us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit encourages us and helps us. Romans 8, that's what chapter 8's about. You, however, are controlled not by your sinful natures. Remember, we've had that cord cut. But by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. So this, the number of things here, we don't have time to get into them, but those people that say somehow after you get saved, you've got to get the Holy Spirit, this, this passage of Scripture blows that away. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not saved. The minute you get saved, the cord of the sin nature is cut, and you're given the Holy Spirit and God's new nature. All of those things together, as well as not being under the law, help us live godly lives. Doesn't mean we live God's lives necessarily. In fact, Paul writes in, 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 in Galatians how my old nature and my new, new nature are in conflict. They're fighting each other, and you had it in your life. I got my new nature saying, Be righteous, David, be righteous, be righteous. And my old nature says, Oh, slip in there, David. Yeah. So, will I'm do, acting righteously or sinfully depends on sort of where I plug my will. If I plug my will into my new nature, under the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to live. I'm going to act righteously. When I sin, all I've done is just plug it into my old nature. Okay? Now, we've talked, section one was his introduction. Section two, he talked about the universal need for the gospel. Section three, justification by faith. Section four, sanctification by faith. Section five is the problem of Israel's rejection. At this point, the Apostle Paul in these first eight chapters has discussed the doctrines of depravity and justification and sanctification and glorification. He has taken us from the gates of hell in our depravity to the streets of heaven in our glorification. Glorious. Shortly he's going to go on and tell us in chapters 12 through 14 about some of our responsibilities to God, how we need to be totally committed to him and our responsibilities to secular governments. We need to obey them. 
and our responsibilities of fellow Christians. We need to help them. But first he has to deal with the problem of Israel's rejection. And that is a big problem because at this point, the previous 2,000 years have been 2,000 years in which God had focused on Israel. I think sometimes Christians fail to fully appreciate how central Israel is to all that God has done. In the first 11 chapters, God dealt with mankind as a whole. In the 12th chapter of Genesis, God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, promised to make of him a great nation, promised to give him the land, him and his descendants the land of Canaan, uh, and promised to bless the world through him. And the rest of the Old Testament is the history of God going about fulfilling that promise. It's all about Jews. That's it. God, 12th chapter of Genesis, God says, Abraham, come over here. I'm going to make of you a great nation, give you the land, bless the world through you. And the rest of the Old Testament is about God, is the history of God going about fulfilling that promise. But he hasn't fulfilled it completely. He hasn't fulfilled it. He promised to make of them a great nation, but not as great as the nation as they will be during the millennium. And a lot of the prophets wrote about how great they will be during the millennium. He promised to give them the land of Canaan, but from the Euphrates River to the river of Egypt, and they haven't possessed all of that land. He promised to bless the world through the Jews. He has by giving us a Savior who was a Jew. Jews gave us our Savior. But that same Savior is also going to sit on the throne of David and rule the world in righteousness. So at this point, the, Jew, the, the, the Gentiles are listening to all that Paul has been writing through these first eight chapters and says, all this is great, but what about the Jews? At this point, too, it was very clear that most of the Christians were Gentiles, not Jews. It's also clear that prior to the establishment of the church, if someone wanted to embrace Jehovah, he had to convert to Judaism and become a, a Jew. Even now, today, when some folks con con convert to Judaism, they go, go through ceremonies in which they become Jews. You actually had to become part of the family of Israel. And you'll notice celebrities sometimes when they talk about converting to Judaism, they'll call themselves Jews. Sammy Davis Jr., remember some of you old folks, the entertainer? He converted to Judaism. And he used to like to joke about being part of two minority groups, the African-Americans and the Jews. He called himself a Jew because he converted and the Jewish people called him a Jew. But now the New Testament church has come along and you don't have to become a Jew. So Paul's Jewish readers are very confused. They're very confused because suddenly a person can be part of God's family and become a Jew. Most of the Christians are Gentiles. and that Indeed, for the next 2,000 years, most would be Gentiles. So uh, Paul is saying, I mean, what they're going to say is, what about Israel? Was Israel rejected? The problem is Israel can't be rejected because there's still promises to be fulfilled. Still promises to be fulfilled, and rejection isn't part of Israel's history because anyone who's read through the Old Testament knows that one day there's a millennium, and during the millennium, who's going to rule the world? Jews! And in the Jerusalem, we know from the book of Revelation, every time you fly in, you're going to, be re you're going to recognize the Jews because they're, they're, the Jewish tribes are, are names written on the foundations of the New Jerusalem. So Paul has to deal with the problem of Israel's rejection if this church thing is legitimate. He's got to answer that question, and in, in chapters 9, 10, and 11, he does. Clearly, Israel is being rejected. But, as he will point out in chapter 11, that rejection is only partial and only temporary. Not all Jews are rejected. Throughout the past 2,000 years, many Jews have come to embrace Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And one day, God, when God finally puts together the entire church, he's going to rapture us to heaven and go back to dealing with whom? With Jews. So, in chapter 11, Paul says, it is true they're being rejected, they're being set aside, but it's only temporary and it's only partial. Not all Jews are being set aside because there have always been a remnant who have, have believed and are saved. But in chapter 9, Paul deals with the, the question of Israel's rejection by saying, first of all, God is sovereign. He does what He wants. Get used to it. This is the great chapter on God's election. This is the chapter when God says, 
Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated, and I made that decision before they were even born, even before they did anything right or wrong, good or bad, because I chose to love one and hate the other. I am a potter, I do with, what I, with the clay as I see fit. So partly God begins this whole discussion of the rejection of Israel, which is temporary and partial, by saying, I'm God, I do what I want. Now sometimes Christians have a hard time with this because they think God ought to be fair in sort of a Jeffersonian sense. Get that out of your head. Bible, fairness is not a biblical concept. Holiness is, righteousness is, godliness is, there are lots of things. But the Bible nowhere says that God has to treat everybody the same way, and he doesn't. He says, I will, I'm a potter, I take the clay I for noble use and some for common use. So he begins the discussion by saying, I'm a sovereign God, I do as I see fit. This is the great chapter on election. That's chapter 9. Chapter 10, he deals with Israel's rejection by pointing out that part of the problem was Israel's problem. You remember before Abraham led the children of Israel to the promised land. He didn't lead them into the promised land. In the book of Deuteronomy, he had this great last sermon. And in the sermon, he said, folks, if you're obedient, God's going to bless you. But if you're disobedient, he is going to curse you. In fact, he'll set you aside. But one day, because the promise he made to Abraham, he'll raise you up again. So what Paul is going to do in chapter 10, is say, in chapter 9, to begin with, when he describes Israel's rejection, Part of the reason for that rejection is because God chose to reject them for a period of time to go out and gather people from among the Gentiles. But secondly, for 1,500 years, uh, the prophets in Israel pleaded with the children of Israel to repent, warning them if they didn't repent, God would set them aside. Well, what happened? They didn't repent. They were idolatrous for about 1,000 of those years. And so now it's time to be setting them aside. God, Moses warned them about this before they went to the land of Canaan. If you're obedient, he's going to bless you. But if you're disobedient, he's going to curse you. But it won't be a permanent curse because he promised Abraham that one day you would become the ruling nation of the world. But if you are stiff-necked and stubborn and being idolatrous, you'll be set aside. And prophet after prophet after prophet followed for the next thousand years, pleading with the Israelites to repent live godly lives, and warning them if they didn't, God would punish them by dispersing them. Well, that dispersion has now come. And that's what Paul's going to write about here. So in terms of the problem of Israel's rejection, chapter 9, uh, Paul writes about God's part in Israel's rejection. That is, God chooses whom he will and who he won't. Man's part in Israel's rejection, the Israelites rejected, wickedly rejected God. And in chapter 11, uh, the Apostle Paul points out that the rejection is only partial and temporary. Now, in the last group of chapters, chapters 12 through 16, Paul talks about some practical aspects of the gospel. In chapter 12, Paul talks about the Christian's responsibility to God and what his, our responsibility to God is total commitment. This is that wonderful passage most of you are familiar with. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. What chapter 12 is about is, okay, in light of everything that you've read about, we've read about, about your depravity, justification by faith, sanctification, setting Israel aside. Now, what does God expect of you? And I'll tell you what he expects. He expects you to be totally, absolutely committed to Christ. And the sacrifice he's talking about here is the burnt offering. You know what a burnt offering was? The whole offering was put on the altar and all burned up. God wants us to be totally burned up for him. He's not talking about suicide. He's talking about total, absolute commitment. By one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being That's right. One offering. Now, he expects us to offer up ourselves as living sacrifices to him. In light of what I've done for you, I gave everything for you. Chapter 12 is God wants total commitment. You say, well, this sounds a little bit extreme. It is. Don't apologize for that. Well, doesn't the Bible talk about moderation? God talks about moderation in food and drink, hopefully exercise. <laughs> I'm extremely moderate there. You could tell. He never discusses moderation in terms of commitment to Him. 
We've taken that moderation thing and we've placed it over in the wrong place. What he does not want is moderation your commitment to him. He says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. And he was talking about the burnt offering that was totally offered up as a sacrifice to God. He does not expect moderation in our commitment to him. He expects total, absolute surrender. For me to live as Christ, to die as what? Gain. So what Paul's saying in this chapter is, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. This is extremism. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. That's chapter 12. Chapter 13, Paul discusses what the Christian's responsibility is to the secular state. And, this, and, the, and um, yeah, I'll always skip through that one. <laughs> Sorry, Bill. Moderate. No moderate, you obey him. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. What he's saying is, it is not up to us to lead a revolt. We are not going to usher in the millennial reign of Christ. The thing about ushering in the 12th Imam and, and their age of peace, that is alien to Christianity. God says, you go out and win men and women to Christ, nurture them in the faith, build the kingdom of God, Live at peace with all men as much as it is possible. God is not calling us to lead a rebellion against the authorities. That's chapter 13. Chapter 14, the Christian's responsibility to fellow Christians were to help one another. And notice what he says here in the first three verses of 14. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak allows only a weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. And this passage, basically what he's saying is, I want you to help one another, but the overarching theme of this whole chapter is, lighten up, to down to lighten up, lighten up. Really, that's the theme of the chapter. We get so bent out of shape, get bent out of shape of the great doctrines of the faith like inspiration of Scripture, deity of Christ, atoning death, justification by faith. Get bent out of shape over those things. So, but if you want to use the King James, that's fine. If you want to use a newer translation, that's fine. You like the old hymns, they're wonderful. You want more contemporary music, that's fine. Some people drink alcoholic beverages, some don't. There's no prohibition in the Scriptures. Get off of it. Get off of it. Some Think that you're only godly if you go on Wednesday night. That's fine. You want to go Wednesday night. But if you don't want to go Wednesday night, you want to go Sunday night, like you folks here, that's fine too. Big theme. God wants us to get bent out of shape over big issues and lighten up on those littles. It's amazing how many wars are fought within the church of Jesus Christ over these Mickey Mouse issues. Now, I'm not suggesting that they're of no importance, but they're not worth going to war over. Not worth going to war over. I've always found it kind of interesting, the number of the mainline denominations. I don't want to step on some toes, but sort of forgive me, allow me this. Many of these mainline denominations started denying the inspiration of Scripture and the deity of Christ years ago, decades ago. And genuine born-again believers stayed in there. But the minute the issue of homosexuality came up, they left. I used to wonder, why? You should have left a long time ago. I mean, issues like the deity of Christ are important, folks. Inspiration of Scripture is important. Fight over those. But people fight over, well, the King James or no King James. Hymns, no hymns. When you have services, when you don't have services. I had one guy say, you know what? I know who's godly and who's not. Do you go to Wednesday night prayer meeting or not? Well, I've got a whole church here that's not godly. We don't have Wednesday night service. Do you understand what we're getting at? And that's really the big theme of this chapter. The big chapter is lighten up. There are things that we want to go to war over, but a whole bunch of stuff we don't. That doesn't mean these other issues of no importance, but they're not worth fighting over. I mean, some of the giants of the faith don't believe in a pre-tribulational rapture or a premillennial return to Christ. Now, I think those are important issues, but there are a lot of giants who didn't believe in those issues, and they were great and godly men, and we need to recognize that and go to war over them. Do you understand what I'm getting at here? That's the big theme of this. Finally, in chapter 15, Paul talks about his plans for the future, that is to come and visit them on the way to Spain, and then there's some greetings. Uh, that's it. Six sections. First, the introduction of the salutation, Paul's desire to visit the church and the theme of the book. 
He then discusses the universal need for the gospel because before he can develop the theme of justification by faith, he's got to convince everyone that they need to be saved. And nobody gets a pass. The pagan man doesn't get a pass. The moral man doesn't get a pass. The religious man doesn't get a pass. And why? Because we're all depraved. That's what the whole world is about. Then he talks about justification by faith. And it's not new, it's old. It's as old as Abraham. And it is, it makes us eternal secure. And once we're saved, we need to live godly lives. And the God helps us by separating us from our old nature, separating us from the law, and giving us the Holy Spirit. When it comes to the problem of Israel's rejection, keep this in mind. God is sovereign. He does what He wants. But Israel had a part to play because they rejected God and were idolaters for years. But their rejection is only temporary and it's partial. With that, next week, Lord willing, we'll start the salutation. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We worship you. We thank you again for this wonderful book. I pray that it will enrich our souls as we work our way through it. More than all, anything else, so Father, I pray as we learn all of this, it will give us a greater understanding, not only of who you are, but what you're all about. And more than anything else, I pray, Lord, that through all this thing, we'll become even more devoted to you. Give us a good week. Bring us back next week to learn more about you and sing your praises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.